As I mentioned, my name is Ben Soljum. I'm the product manager uh, here at Motion DSP for our forensic uh, software applications. Uh, also on the call, we have with us uh, Candace Capella, who's our director of sales. And then we also have Aaron and Rob, uh, who are also part of our sales team, and they're joining us on the call today uh, as well. <clears throat> I think we have one or two other people joining us right now, so I'm going to wait for just another second uh, before we get started. Go ahead and bring up the application. So uh, today's demo is actually going to consist of kind of uh, really two demos, the first being for Ecana Spotlight, which is our redaction um, uh, solution, and then the second demo will be for Ecana Forensic, which is our video enhancement uh, solution. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and begin our demo this morning. Uh, uh, just as a, a, uh, some housekeeping notes here, feel, you can feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, I will stop at the end of the first demo for questions uh, specific to that segment, and then I'll stop again at the end of the second demo for questions uh, specific to that segment or just any other general uh, questions, either technical or uh, sales-wise. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and begin. And as I mentioned, we're going to be demoing you can a spotlight uh, first, which is our video redaction uh, tool. And I'm going to go ahead and delete a couple of things here that we we're working on with some other demos so that we start from scratch here for this example. Um, and uh, both you can a spotlight and you can a forensic uh, uh, can be um, purchased and installed as separate standalone applications. Um, they can also, if, if, uh, if somebody purchases both tools together, they can be run as a single combined application, um, which is what I'm going to be uh, demonstrating for you here this morning. Um, and really the only difference uh, would be is that uh, the, uh, standalone applications wouldn't have some of the other uh, tools that would be in, uh, in, the, uh, in the other application. Uh, but the user interfaces are virtually identical, and I'll point out the differences in the, uh, in the, in the user interfaces as we go through the demo. So we're going to start with the kind of spotlight, um, and you'll see that it is the, uh, the user interface is broken down into three main components. And uh, both, both the kind of spotlight and the kind of forensic are uh, uh, desktop applications, Windows-based uh, desktop applications that install directly onto your workstation or laptop. Um, and when we open up uh, uh, either of these products, we are greeted with a similar sort of user interface, which, as I said before, has three um, uh, main components, starting from left to right. On the left, we have what we call the, the, the project area or the project tab or the project list. Basically, this lists all of the different videos that we've imported uh, into this project, and I can break uh, this project down into subfolders. So if I have a lot of different videos, um, I can create subfolders and organize those videos. Uh, that way, if I have uh, an event um, that, uh, you know, covered a lot of, you know, CCTV cameras or body-worn cameras, uh, we could organize those cameras into a logical folder structure. Uh, most people typically treat a, ca uh, a project as like a case uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the law enforcement community. So when they get a new case, they would then create a new project in Spotlight, and the same for, uh, for Ikenna Forensic. Um, and as I mentioned before, you can create uh, different subfolders within the project uh, to better organize. We can move um, files around within uh, these different lists, and we can even move the folders themselves around. Um, and that's pretty much it for the, uh, the projects. I will come back to it here in a second. Uh, kind of moving into the middle, this is what we refer to as our video workspace area or the, or the preview window. We have a uh, timeline and playback controls that we'll be discussing uh, more detail here in a second. And then on the far right-hand side, we have uh, the spotlight tool section or the properties. Um, this is where we'll control uh, kind of different properties and functions of the different redactions that we're going to be adding to the video itself. So that's the kind of the basic UI breakdown. and the workflow kind of follows the same sort of left to right path. It starts on the left hand side uh, on the project side where we can uh, come up and import a new video into our project. Um, and it's just as simple as clicking on the file button 
uh, and then going to uh, section where we have our videos that we want to import, and it imports that video right into our project. And you'll notice here with, with each of these videos, we get a thumbnail preview. We have the title of the video, and the duration of the video, or the size and the frame rate of the video. And, that's, and we can click on uh, different videos and have them come up in the player window. <clears throat> so now moving into, now that we've uh, imported our video and we've loaded it into our video workspace, uh, we'll, we'll come to the actual video workspace area. We're going to go ahead and, and fill out our screen here. And you'll notice below the, the, the preview area, um, there is what we refer to as the layer section. And every video by default will have what we call, what we refer to as the background layer. And basically what this means is anything that we apply to the background layer, it's going to apply it to the whole video. It's, it's the base, the base, base layer uh, of the video, the background layer. So we add a keyframe, we'll come over here and we'll add our keyframe button. And we'll talk about what keyframes are in a second. But we're basically saying we want to uh, apply something to the background starting at this point for the duration of the video. And we can basically blur the entire video. We can make it blocky. Uh, we can darken the background, so on and so forth. I'm going to go ahead and delete this layer. And, and uh, this will make more sense as we, uh, as we begin to add other things to the video, um, how this works. Um, and then below the background layer, if there's audio present in the video, then there will also be an audio layer. Um, and so if we want to redact the audio, we would do it in this audio layer here, utilizing our keyframe button. And we'll discuss more about audio redaction as the demo goes along. Um, and then below the audio layer, we have what we call the audio waveform. So you can actually see the peaks and valleys uh, within the audio. Uh, this particular example here, uh, there's actually a, a loud uh, hum in the background that's being picked up. And so that's why it has a pretty consistent uh, look to the waveform. Um, I have some other examples to show you where there's uh, kind of more variance, where there's speech, and then periods of, of silence within the audio waveform. Below the audio waveform, we have the video timeline. It starts at zero and goes to the end of the video, which in this case is a minute and 23 seconds. Uh, below the timeline, we have a, set, a kind of a secondary timeline. We call it the timeline navigator. Um, and this allows us to zoom in on the timeline. I can uh, pinch on the left and right hand side and zoom into a particular part of the video. So now I'm zoomed in uh, to uh, around the 30 second mark and 50 second mark of the video. So this is just a, a tool that allows us, especially if you have a larger video, a longer video, maybe a video that's 30 minutes long, um, but you're really only interested in maybe two or three minutes of that video, you can zoom in to that two or three minute section of the video and really focus in on that. And you'll notice too that um, our audio waveform also zooms in as well, so you can actually zoom in and get a better look at where uh, uh, where speech is occurring within the audio waveform. And then as we zoom back out, both the timeline and the audio waveform zoom back out uh, to the to the full view. Below the timeline navigator, we have our playback controls. We can play the video. Uh, pause. I'm going to mute the volume here. Um, we can pause the video, we can uh, adjust the playback speed so we can play it back up to four times the normal speed, or we can slow it down by a quarter of the normal speed. So if we want to quickly review something, we could increase the speed. And if we want to really stop and analyze the section of the video, we could slow down the playback. Um, we can also step forward uh, one frame at a time. We can go back one frame at a time. Uh, we can jump back to the beginning of the video. We can jump to the end of the video. And you see here, I've got this loop button. Uh, it's now it's disabled. I'm going to go ahead and enable it. And now it's going to jump back to the beginning. Let's see, we'll do that again. You'll see it'll basically just loop back to the beginning of the video. And then next to that are some additional useful features. Um, we call them our, our kind of our trimming buttons. So if we want to trim a section of the timeline that we want to work with, so maybe we want to start around the 22nd mark, and we'll set that as our start point. And you'll see it adds a little blue uh, line to our timeline. And we want to go to maybe the 40-second mark. We jump to that part and, and add our ending mark. And you see now it highlights that section of the timeline. So now all of our playback controls um, uh, are relative to this section that we've highlighted. So it loops just this section. 
when we tell it to jump to the end, it only jumps to the end of the section. When we tell it to jump to the beginning, it jumps to the beginning of the section. And then later on, when we would go and process this video, we just process this section of the video. So again, this can be a, a, a great way to save time uh, uh, in terms of processing. Rather than processing the entire video, you can process just the section of the video uh, that you need to redact. And then you can also utilize the uh, the timeline navigator to zoom in on that section as well so that you're only seeing uh, that section uh, within the, the timeline uh, preview here. And then we can zoom back out. And then we can also uh, <clears throat> clear this section and we can highlight another section uh, that we want to work with as well if we want to. We'll go ahead and clear those, jump back to the beginning. Um, and then the, the, the last two buttons I want to show you here in the kind of the center part is the snapshot button and the video button. And these are, these are how we, these buttons are how we go about creating uh, products, what we refer to as products uh, within the, the tool itself. So um, after we go in and, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you this here in a minute, but as we go in and we begin to redact things in the video, we can take a snapshot at any point in the video and it'll add uh, to our products section, which I've already uh, done some here. I'll go ahead and delete these, and then I'll show you how we do this here in a minute. Um, but it would add these products to the, our, our product tray here that we can uh, hide and reveal um, at any point. Um, then we can also uh, uh, create a full redacted version of the video um, as well, and we'll discuss that more here in a second. So um, now that we've, we've kind of gone through the playback controls and uh, you know, getting video in. Um, now we're actually going to show you kind of in a very simple fashion um, how the redaction uh, part of the tool works and how we track different objects and redact them. Um, so we have a couple of different uh, tools up here on the top left-hand side. Uh, the first being our ellipse tool, which is what we'll use here in a minute. But this allows us to draw uh, circles and ellipses over objects that we can then uh, track and redact. We have a rectangle tool, which is useful for things like uh, license plates or um, document signs. And then we also have, below that, we have a text tool. So if we want to actually overlay some text on top of the video, uh, we can do that as well. Maybe we want to label this you know, front door camera or something like that. We could add a text label to this uh, video. Um, with uh, a, you know most of the video that, uh, that comes from body-worn cameras now, they typically will have the officer's name already uh, added to the video and then a, a, a date and time stamp added to the video. Um, but if not, like we have in this case here where we have nothing on the screen, we also have the ability to add either what we call a video time uh, tool timestamp, which allows us to basically put in a timestamp that starts at zero and goes to a minute and 23 seconds, which is the duration of this video. Or we can put in a timestamp, which we call a real time timestamp, where we actually can specify what the what the actual start time is of this video so if we know this event takes place at 5 23 p.m we could enter that as our starting point of the video so i'm going to go back select our ellipse tool and then i'm going to going to draw an ellipse around the clerk's face here and what i want you to pay attention to is above the background layer um, a new layer is going to be added as i draw this uh, around the clerk's face and let go and you see it adds a new layer called Ellipse 2 for our Ellipse 2 object in the preview uh, window. I'm going to double click on this. I'm going to change it to clerk and hit enter. And you'll notice here um, that it, uh, since we're at the beginning of the video, it creates a keyframe right here where we added uh, this circle. So anytime we add an object to the video, it's going to add a keyframe. Uh, in, the, in our timeline wherever, wherever we uh, first added that object. And that's going to be um, what we utilize as a part of our tracking here in a second. Um, now, the next thing you'll notice here is that we can adjust some of the properties of this. Right now, it's set to do a block. We can make this a blur. Um, we can make it a circle, so it's just circling a space. We can change the outline color of that circle. Or we can do a solid color altogether. And then lastly, we can choose to do nothing. And I'll show you why you would want to do that here in just a second. Um, you'll also notice here that it's, there's a label here on this object that says clerk. Um, that will not show up in the, in, the, in the final redacted version that we'll process. This is just so that we know that this object corresponds with this layer down here. As we add more layers, we need to be able to tell which object uh, goes with which layer. 
Um, we can remove that if we want to not see that, and then we can add it back in. Um, and then the last thing you notice here is there's an exclamation point, and that just means that we haven't processed uh, this object yet in terms of our tracking, which we'll do here in just a minute. Uh, but the next thing, the, the, the last thing I want to show you before we did that is right now we have selected, you know, rather than to do a blur or a block, we have selected to not do anything. And now if we go back to our background layer, we add a keyframe, we set the background to blur, we've basically done a reverse uh, redaction. So instead of redacting the clerk's face, we've actually done the opposite. We're revealing his face and redacting everything else. And this, this, uh, this type of method can be very useful where you have a large group of people, 15 or 20 people, and rather than going in and having to track and redact 15 or 20 different faces, you could go in and redact part or all of the video and then uh, utilizing your ellipse and rectangle tools, you could highlight one or two or three objects or faces that you want to have uh, remain visible throughout the duration of the video. So just another way of being able to redact the video and, and kind of limit the amount of time that you spend. But we're going to go ahead and we're going to do kind of a sort of a traditional sort of redaction here. We're going to set this to do a blur. And uh, in order to be able to track this clerk, we have our first keyframe, which is our starting point that we're going to utilize for tracking, and we need to have a second point, a second keyframe or ending point. And so what I'm going to do now is I pick up and move this object, and when I let go, you'll see it's going to add another white diamond right here where, where we are on the timeline to signify our second keyframe. So I'm going to move this over and let go, and it adds our second keyframe there. And I'm just going to do some adjusting here uh, with this keyframe like so. And then the next thing I'm going to do, well, and since I moved it around, I'm automatically it, it triggered the track. And so you can see right now, this white dotted line uh, is showing that it's actually processing uh, between these two keyframes right here, between this first keyframe and the second keyframe, it's processing uh, and, and, tr and tracking the clerk's face. So and you can see we can actually go down here and you can see, uh, we can see what's already been processed to date, and you can see we're going to have to go back in and make one small correction here in a second. Um, but while it's doing that, uh, the next thing I want to show you is that we can actually redact more than one object at a time. So I'm going to go ahead and focus in on the gun here in this gentleman's hand. I'm going to come up, click on our ellipse tool again, and I'm going to draw a circle. And now this time, instead of redacting it, I'm going to call attention to it. So I'm going to make this a red circle. We'll make the border a little bit bigger. And it, like we did with our with our clerk layer, we're going to add a second keyframe right around here, right before he puts the gun away. And we're just going to move this around. And when I let go, it's going to add that second keyframe again. We'll come up, hit our start tracking button, and we'll process um, the tracking to follow the gun and the, and the other gentleman's hand. While it's doing that, we're going to go back to our first layer. We're going to check on our clerk, and I can tell we're going to have to make one slight tweak right around here. You can see his chin starts to come up, and we're just going to make one slight adjustment. Make this a little bit larger, and you can see our gun layer is now done. We're going to process this new keyframe that we've added to our last keyframe. And what you see here, this is actually... Um, one of the things that really sets us apart from a lot of the other redaction tools that are out there is we utilize an automated tracking solution uh, with our key for, with our beginning and ending keyframe, but we also give users the ability to input uh, to manually introduce additional keyframes to help uh, correct any tracking errors that occur. So most tools will either utilize a fully automated tracking solution, which will fail inevitably, um, sometimes multiple times, and there's not easy, there, there aren't easy ways to really go in and correct that. So a lot of times you have to go in and add additional layers and just all kinds of uh, additional work that you shouldn't have to do. Um, the, other, the other method is a totally manual method where you're going in and literally every frame you're having to make one slight tweak, and that can be very tedious and time consuming. Um, so now this is done. And you'll notice here that our exclamation point disappears once the tracking is complete, that exclamation point disappears, so we know that it's also done. And we also can tell because our dotted line is now turned into a solid line here in that layer. I'm gonna go ahead and play this forward a little bit. And 
just see how this looks, we may go ahead and make another slight correction here. We'll go ahead and process that again. Um, while it's doing that, we'll go ahead and check our, our gentleman with the gun here and see how this is doing. We'll kind of jump ahead in the timeline and see it's following the gun pretty well. So that looks to be pretty, pretty good. We'll go back to our store clerk here. We'll let that process. Um, we'll go ahead and play this because we can actually preview the part that it's already processed and we'll see how this is looking. Now, as I mentioned before, these labels that are showing up, these are just so that we know that this clerk uh, is a part of this layer down here and this ellipse 5 is a part of this layer here. Um, we can actually double click on that ellipse and we can call that gun just so that it's a little easier to tell. And now the tracking is done in our clerk layer again. And this looks pretty good. And again, we can turn these labels off if we want to. We can turn it back on. Um, if we actually, if we turn them off, we can actually add captions to each of these. We can come down here to the text. And for our clerk, I could type in clerk. And I could adjust where that's positioned and how it looks and even the size and font and all of that. So we can actually add captions to any of these objects and those captions will follow that object around. We can even add an arrow that follows the object around. We can change the position and location uh, of that arrow as well if we want to call attention to something. Um, I'm going to go ahead and remove that. So now that we've, we've uh, kind of completed our rudimentary sort of uh, redaction here, um, the next thing I want to show you is how we redact audio. So we would come down to our audio layer and we would find the maybe right around here is where we want to begin our redaction. Uh, we add, click on our keyframe um, button here and it adds a keyframe right at this point. And you'll see that there's a couple of different uh, uh, audio reduction map, uh, methods. We can use, utilize a simple mute. Um, we can introduce a loud beep sound. And we can control the volume of that beep sound. And then the last option is this resample. And this allows us to, uh, to still understand what the person is saying, but kind of modulate or mask their voice a little bit so we don't, uh, we uh, kind of uh, hides the identity of the person who's speaking. So if you have confidential informant or somebody whose identity um, you want to keep, uh, you know, confidential by not only redacting their face, but also kind of masking their voice. And that's what the resample option does. But we'll just keep this simple. We'll do a mute. And then we'll go to where we want that mute to stop. We'll add another keyframe there. And then we'll uh, set the active property to off. So now it's just being applied uh, at that point there. And we can go and we can add additional uh, audio redactions by selecting uh, keyframes and then turning off at the second keyframe. And we can do as many of these as we want uh, within the audio layer itself. So now that we've kind of, like I said, now that we've completed kind of a very uh, basic sort of uh, video and audio redaction, we can make a couple of different products here. So we could go in and uh, select our snapshot, and it's going to basically make a uh, take a still of this redacted vid from this redacted video here and save it in, into our products area. Uh, we can also create a redacted video by clicking on our video button, and we have we can uh, output as an ABI, uh, compressed and uncompressed, a WMV or MPEG-4, which is what I'm going to choose. I'm going to hit save. And it should just take it a couple of seconds to process our video and then add it into our product tray up here. And we'll go to our video section. You'll see if we view all. The snapshot is, is displayed as a camera. It has the timestamp where it was taken from, and the timestamp even shows up as a little kind of yellowish, orangish line in our timeline. So this was taken around the 52nd mark in this video. And then our redacted video, it basically, it starts right at the beginning at zero, and it goes for the entire duration, which is a minute and 23 seconds. Now I mentioned um, that we can also process a smaller portion by utilizing our clip-in and clip-out marks here. So we can start around the 30 second mark and go to the 50 second mark. And now we click on our video button, click save. 
and when it goes to process it, the resulting video will only be uh, 20 seconds long. So if you we compare these side by side, we can see our second video, instead of starting at zero, it starts right around the uh, 29, 30 second mark, which is right here, and then it goes for 20 seconds. So uh, it, it would process significantly faster because it was a smaller portion of the video. And then we can just simply click Save As to save these uh, products outside of our project, save them into my test folder, call this short clip. And I can do the same with the other clip. Click Save As, and I can call this full clip. And that's it. So by default, it saves these, these, these videos and these snapshots within our project, and then it's just as simple as clicking Save As to, uh, to, to basically export them or save them outside of our project. Um, the, the last thing I want to show you uh, is that we have a, uh, a redaction report that we can generate from this. And we have two options for doing that. One is uh, the first option, which is just generating a report for the current video, which is this video right here. Or we can generate a report for every single video in our project. And uh, the, the report will contain information about our original video, which is our store robbery video, as well as any products that we've made. So in this case, there'll be our, our full clip video, our partial clip video, and our snapshot. So I'll just go ahead and click Generate Report. We'll call this Test. Hit Save. And now it generates uh, this, this uh, redaction report. It has my name at the top, my company name, company logo. Those, uh, these items can be customized within the application. Uh, we have the date and time that the report was made, the version of the software that we were running, the computer, etc. We have our original video here. Uh, we have a lot of basic information about the original video, including the MD5 hash. Um, we have general metadata information, video uh, codec uh, metadata information, audio uh, metadata information. Um, and then, it, as I mentioned, because I'm running both forensic and spotlight, I have a combined report here, but there's nothing in that section. So we'll just jump down to our spotlight redacted video section. We can see the location of our uh, redacted video in our project, some basic information, again, about the original. And then we come down here and we can see uh, uh, the different layers. So we have our gun layer. We can see that it's an ellipse. Uh, we can see that our first keyframe starts at that timestamp. We can see where our next keyframe occurs. And we can see all of the other properties uh, associated with those keyframes. Then we come down to our clerk layer. And we can see that it's also an ellipse. Uh, we can see that we utilized a blur. Um, we can see the, t uh, the keyframe timestamps um, and all the different properties that were used. And then we can scroll down to our audio layer as well, and we can see where those different keyframes were added. Um, we can see you know, that, we're, that we utilized a mute. So we basically have here kind of a history or an audit trail of everything that was done uh, everything that was redacted, what sort of object was used, where it was added into the video, et cetera. Here we have our second video, the, its location, and again, we have all of the information about the gun layer, the clerk layer, uh, and the audio layer. And then finally, we have our snapshot, um, and, and that snapshot also shows uh, the, the different layers that are included within uh, that snapshot. So that's kind of the, the redaction report in a nutshell. And I'm going to go ahead and pause now and open up uh, for any questions uh, specific to Ecana Spotlight. And I know we've got a lot of folks on the call, so uh, don't be shy. Go ahead and uh, ask any questions that you might have. All right, well, since nobody is asking any questions, I'm going to go ahead and move on with the uh, next part of the demonstration, which is for Ikenna Forensic, which is our video enhancement tool. As I stated before, feel free to ask any questions as I'm going through the demo, and then I will stop again at the end. For any final questions about uh, Ikenna Forensic or Ikenna Spotlight or any other sort of general questions or sales questions you might have, so I'm going to go ahead and now I'm going to transition uh, over into Ecana Forensics since I'm uh, utilizing uh, our combined application here. I'll just click on our Spotlight button. And you'll notice here the only thing that really changes in the user interface is on the right-hand side. Um, the left-hand side, the project view remains the same. Our video workspace 
uh, remains relatively the same, uh, minus the layers section that's missing. Uh, we, we're not redacting anything, uh, any kind of forensics. So we don't have any redaction layers uh, listed here. But the big difference is on the right-hand side, instead of having our spotlight properties, we have our uh, enhancement filters, uh, which we'll be discussing a little bit more here in a second. And I'm gonna jump to a different example here. Um, again, like I said, you know, the, the project list here is, uh, is identical to, you kind of spotlight all the inf same information is present. Uh, over here in our video workspace area, um, all of our playback controls are the same, except we also have the addition of a reverse playback function, any kind of forensics. We can actually play the video backwards. Uh, we can't do that in Spotlight just because of how the tracking algorithm uh, is implemented. Uh, we can't track those uh, objects in reverse. Uh, so we can't play the video in reverse in Spotlight, but we can play the video in reverse uh, in any kind of forensic, uh, which can be a useful feature. Again, we have the ability to adjust playback speed and uh, trim the video, et cetera, et cetera. And then we also have the ability to create enhanced snapshots and enhanced videos. And those show up again in our product uh, tray here. Uh, we have our, our timeline and our timeline navigator. Um, and so we'll go ahead and kind of jump over into our uh, enhancement filters. And so the, the thing, one of the things that really kind of makes Ikenna Forensic uh, different or than, than a lot of other sort of sorts of video forensic tools that are out there um, is that most most other tools utilize a method called frame averaging uh, when they're trying to enhance a section of a video and and really frame averaging is just taking uh, information from uh, surrounding frames and kind of averaging that if those the information from those surrounding frames together the pixel information together and that hopefully there's enough good information scattered around those frames that when you average them together, you get a better, clearer picture uh, of what's going on in the video. Um, the downside of utilizing frame averaging is that it also um, can average bad information uh, to, uh, into that end result. And by bad information, I think I mean things like uh, signal noise, compression artifacts. Uh, you'll see as I jump through uh, uh, this video here, um, uh, the, the, the signal noise and the artifacts kind of uh, change from one frame to the next, so there's some randomness to it. And so we also utilize a multi-frame approach, but instead of averaging all the values together, we're selective, and we, uh, we give the application a series of frames to sample. So in this case, right now, we're just getting it one frame, which is the current frame that we're looking at, but we can uh, bump that up to three frames, and now we're actually sampling the current frame of video plus the frame that occurred just before and the frame that's uh, that's occurring just after it. So we're getting it a three-frame window to kind of analyze, uh, to look at what things are occur occurring randomly and, and consistently across those three frames. And so now the more frames that we give the application to analyze, uh, the better it's able to determine what things are actually occurring consistently from one frame to the next and what things are changing randomly from one frame to the next and to hopefully discard you know the random or the bad information and and just utilize the the best information from these surrounding frames and we can actually sample all the way up to 51 frames of video so that that means we're looking at 25 frames that occurred right before this frame the current frame and then 25 frames after it so really as we play this video for every second of video, we're actually processing 1,500 frames uh, of video at any one time, plus plus the, the the frames themselves. So it's actually a little bit more than that. Um, and what what enables us to do that is that we you'll see up here at the top, I've uh, I've enabled GPU processing. So the GPU is the our the graphics process uh, graphical processing unit, which is uh, our your graphics card. In this case, my NVIDIA graphics card on my laptop. And there's a lot more computing power that we can harness by utilizing our, our computer's GPU. And so we can actually process this vast amount of data with 1,500 frames of information per second um, and instantly see the results uh, of that. Uh, you know, as we uh, make these adjustments, I can play this video. And I can make these adjustments to the video and instantly see the results. Um, and I can expand on this and we can do, we can apply some other enhancements to this as well. We can 
utilize our super resolution factor, which is kind of our smart upscaler. So you'll see the original size of this video here. It's 192 by 144 pixels. Uh, we can choose to upscale that by factor two. So now it's doubled the horizontal and vertical pixels. We can go by factor three and it triples it. And we can go by factor four and it quadruples it. So what this, what this allows us to do is it allows us to basically blow this image up 16 times the normal size without losing any quality uh, from the original size of the video. Um, in this example here, uh, we don't have a lot of movement. We have some movement, but uh, the background is remaining fairly static. And so because of that, we can utilize our fusion parameter as well to uh, get some additional clarity uh, from the, the writing on these books. And then we can apply um, our accuracy and detail mode. And this kind of, while distorting certain parts of the video, it's really useful for kind of sharpening uh, the, the text on these books and being able to uh, better make out what they say. If we turn these off, you'll see it kind of almost gets a little bit blurry, especially when you look at these two examples here. And then when we uh, uh, enable these parameters, they have a sharper sort of look, and we can actually read those a little bit better. And this is really useful for uh, things like license plates, signs, things of that nature. Um, and it doesn't just stop there. We can apply uh, other filters. We can apply light color and contrast, deblurring, sharpening, etc. And we can, you know, at any point we can adjust parameters and you see we can instantly see the results. This is another benefit of utilizing uh, our computer's um, uh, GPU is that uh, instead of having to wait for each of these individual filters to be rendered across our entire video, we instantly process and see the results without having to wait. Uh, most other tools, you apply a new filter and it basically has to render that filter across the entire video and that could take a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes depending on the length of the video. Um, and then each time you make an adjustment to a parameter within that filter, then you have to re-render the video again. So it becomes a very tedious, time-consuming process. And with the kind of forensic, with just a couple of clicks of my mouse, I can turn filters on and off and make a, make adjustments. Um, yeah, Josh, I do have a light example. I'll, I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, so again, this is really the, the power of being able to, to utilize the software is the ability to quickly import it and to uh, instantly start applying different filters and see uh, the results instantly displayed uh, in our video. So I had somebody ask about a, a, a light example. So here is an example um, from a, a dark room, and I'll go ahead and just play this for you so you can kind of see how it looks originally. Um, there's some stuff going on in the background that's really hard to make out, and just very difficult overall to make out what's going on in here. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reset all of this, and we'll just turn on a couple of these things one at a time. We'll start with our uh, contrast, and then our light and color, and then our resolution. And then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to split the screen so you can see um, I have this line here on the left-hand side is the original video, and then on the, uh, the left-hand side is the original, and then the right-hand side is the enhanced. We'll hit play, and you'll be able to see a huge difference now uh, between the original dark version of the video and then the enhanced version. You can actually see uh, these guys standing up here with uh, guitars, and it looks like the guy has a Batman logo on his shirt. Um, whereas before, we could kind of make out that there might be some people up there, but can't really clearly see what, you know, if there, if there are people there, that if they have anything with them. But here we can clearly see this guy has a guitar, this guy has a guitar, this guy's got a, uh, he's holding a microphone or a microphone stand in front of him. Uh, so much, you know, really quickly able uh, to see what's going on here with just a couple of clicks uh, from our filters here and just utilizing the default settings. I haven't even... Uh, made any serious adjustments other than a resolution filter. Um, I just uh, added, you know, sampled some additional frames. So everything else is just default settings. Um, another kind of uh, example I want to show you is uh, this license plate example. And we're going to start by utilizing our, uh, uh, not utilizing our crop, we'll turn that. We're going to utilize our region of interest. So you can see here um, we can draw a box and so rather than uh, enhancing the entire video, we just really want to enhance uh, this section of the video where the license plate is and where um, there's a, 
uh, the car make uh, is is right here on the back of the trunk as well. So we can uh, we can turn this off, turn it back on, and then we can um, kind of redraw this area right here. We can move it around. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through and I'm going to apply some uh, various enhancements to this uh, video. So we're going to utilize our resolution filter, our light and color filter. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see a little bit better here. Um, so I'll start over again. So here's our original. Can't really make out what's here or here, uh, but utilizing even just our super resolution, I can already read what this says, but we can make it even clearer uh, by combining a couple of additional filters with this. We can utilize our sharpen and then our deblurring, and then we can maybe even utilize detail mode. So here we can really clearly say that this says Subaru. The license plate says 3PLA273. And we can go to our products section here. I'm going to go ahead and delete a few of these that I was showing in the last demo. We can take a snapshot. It's going to add it here. We can go to a different part of the video. We can move our box up. We can take another snapshot. Maybe we're going to take off that detail mode. We'll take another snapshot. And then um, now that we're done with this, we can uh, save any of these snapshots out as well. Um, but we're, you know, again, with just a short uh, period of time, we were able to take this video and uh, enhance this license plate, create a snapshot of, of that uh, enhanced license plate, and save it outside of Ikenna. So again, the real benefit of using Ikenna Forensic is just uh, uh, the, the power of the enhancements and the speed at which you're able to uh, derive those results. Um, one last example I want to show you here is get a partial um, by examining uh, part of this video here. So we're going to apply these enhancements again. We're going to zoom into this section of the video. And again, it's not perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and apply some And we can also turn on our false color. So this is kind of another cool tool here. We can reverse the color space, um, but we can see part of the license plate here. It's kind of, you see a six, a two, and a nine, um, but we're able to actually get um, a partial uh, with that. Yeah, so Josh, <laughs> again, you're, 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 uh, ahead of, you're ahead of me here. So um, I'll, I'll talk about the audit trail here in a second. So we, uh, Move this around. Yeah, so here we can clearly, we can much clearly uh, see here, uh, much more clearly see, we can see an N, a P, a 3, a 2, and a 9, and then a 6, a 2, and then possibly a 3 or an 8 or a 9 here as well. So again, we weren't able to get a full uh, reading here, but we were able to at least get a partial. And if we go back to the original, uh, zoom back in again, if we go back to the original, we started with basically nothing, and then we at least got a partial uh, from this example here. We'll take a snapshot of that. So now that we've done all of this, uh, Josh asked if there's an audit trail with this as well. So we'll go back to our license plate example here. So we have a video and three snapshots. We'll go up here. We'll generate a report here uh, for this video. We're going to go ahead and replace it. And again, it's, it's the same uh, formatted report, my name, company name, company logo. Uh, date and time I generated the report, the version of the software that I used. We have our original video. We have information about the original video, including the MD5 hash of the original. And then we have uh, our, our first enhanced video. We have the MD5 hash for that video. And then you see the specific settings that were used uh, to create that particular uh, enhanced video. And then the same for these snapshots. We have the MD5 of the enhanced still, as well as MD5 of the unenhanced frame. And then we have uh, all of the settings that were used uh, in creating that enhanced snapshot. And then here's just a, a, another snapshot that we created. And we can see the resolution settings, the contrast settings, the light and color settings, etc. And then I think this is the third and final one here, and we see our settings here. So um, with this report, you have uh, uh, you have uh, a tr an audit trail or history of exactly what you did to this video to create these products here. 
and you could uh, present that in court. So if you wanted to present uh, one of these items that you generated uh, as a product, you could run that report and it'll actually, uh, you know, serve as documentation for what, uh, what specific filters and what specific settings you used to create this enhanced version of the video. And then you could also uh, give that report and that same video, the original video, to another person and utilizing the same version of Ikenna, they could take that report, import that original video, and look at that report and, and uh, apply those same settings uh, in, in Ikenna and produce that exact same, uh, those exact same enhanced snapshots and or videos. So the, the uh, report serves kind of two purposes. It serves one is kind of a, a, an audit trail or history of what you've done, but two, it also serves as a way of being able to uh, kind of uh, verify um, that uh, what you've done, uh, that you've done what you've said that you've done to the video, because somebody else could, could go back and reproduce uh, your results utilizing the software. So that's uh, kind of it for Ikenna Forensic. We've covered you know, some of the basic use cases, license plates, uh, dark areas, things like that. Um, we've talked about the audit trail, uh, how you export videos out. Um, that's it. So with the remainder of our time, I just want to open up to any questions pertaining to either Ikenna uh, Spotlight or Ikenna Forensic or uh, um, any other sorts of uh, general questions or sales questions anybody might have.